Hello guys and happy Tuesday. Um, we're gonna get started with our second um, junior beef cattle update. Tonight's topic is um, forms of natural uh, service. Tonight, our speaker is Miss Jennifer Hurlbert. She just defended her thesis last week. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to send them to us in the chat and we'll ask them when we can. Um, Jennifer, if you wanna give yourself a little intro and then go into your presentation, we'd sure appreciate it. Probably helps if I turn my microphone on. There we go. Uh, can you see my presentation here, Jill? Yep, right, great. great version. Awesome. All right, thank you, Jill, for that introduction. Um, like she said, my name is Jennifer Hurlbert. Um, just defended my uh, master's here on Friday. So officially starting my PhD program uh, with Dr. Carl Dolan at NDSU uh, in the area of reproductive physiology. Um, and so a lot of the work that I get to do uh, is based off of uh, bovine reproduction, uh, specifically though, some, some impacts of nutrition around the time of breeding and that how that affects reproduction. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about some, some nutrition, but we're not gonna get too deep into it because I know that there's some uh, upcoming webinars that will focus a little bit more on that pre-breeding uh, nutrition. Uh, but the goal today is to talk about natural breeding service uh, and kind of give you guys as uh, some options uh, maybe you have some goals of going to a ranch or managing a ranch, or maybe you just want to learn a little bit more about beef cattle production. Um, and so last week you talked about AI. Today we're going to mix it up and talk about natural breeding service. Um, so with that, we will get started. Okay, um, so just an outline of what we'll be covering today. Um, so pretty simply put, uh, there's a couple big important pieces uh, of this formula uh, that equate to pregnancy success. Um, and so obviously we've got some cows involved, we've got some bulls involved, uh, but then also some, some people factors as well. Um, and so in, in order to successfully do a natural service in a cow-calf operation, we need to make sure we've got all of our ducks in a row in terms of our females uh, and the males that we're going to be using for that breeding program. Um, and so to start some cow calf operations, uh, just briefly, uh, maybe some of you come from from cow calf operations yourselves, and maybe some of you don't, but I want to make sure that we're all at the on the same page uh, before we get too deep into this. Um, and so a cow calf operation essentially is one uh, that has revenue every single year in the form of a calf. Um, and so what's really important for a calf to be born to a cow every year, every 365 days, we need to have a successful breeding program. That means cows need to be getting pregnant. And so you learned last week that there's lots of ways that this can be done. Um, but we wanna talk a little bit first about uh, the basics of pregnancy, uh, what needs to happen, regardless of what kind of breeding program you're using, uh, we need to make sure that we understand what's actually required of a successful pregnancy uh, so that we as managers can make sure that these things uh, or do the best that we can to make sure that these things are happening. And so uh, the three things that are required for a successful pregnancy, and these are pretty primary, these are pretty basic, but these are the big ticket items. Uh, one, we need fertilization to happen. Uh, I hope most of you are, are old enough to understand that part of biology, but essentially we need sperm and we need an egg. Uh, and so that's our male component and our female component uh, and fertilization needs to be successful. Uh, now we'll talk in a little bit about why fertilization might fail or why, uh, why pregnancies might not even be established if you have uh, poor uh, reproductive uh, performance in your males or your females, uh, but that's where we'll, leave, where we'll leave that for now. The second part of a pregnancy though is the establishment of that pregnancy. And so there's lots of things that go into that uh, but the primary one is the establishment of the placenta. Uh, and the placenta is essentially uh, this, this tissue that surrounds the baby in the female reproductive tract. And it's kind, it kind of serves as an organ uh, and a facilitator for nutrients, for blood, for oxygen uh, from the mom to the baby during pregnancy. And so a really important piece of a healthy pregnancy or one that's going to be established uh, and maintained through, uh, through its full term is the functionality of that placenta and its ability to deliver nutrients to that uh, fetal calf. 
Uh, and then finally, uh, the maintenance of the pregnancy uh, is ultimately important for carrying that calf to term uh, to 280 or 285 days, uh, or give or take some days on, on either side of that for pregnancy length. Pregnancy length. So just wanted to cover some basics there to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of pregnancy. And then we can talk about some options for how to get there. Um, so again, you talked about artificial insemination last week, uh, some estrus synchronization options. Not sure if you touched on any embryo transfer. I don't think so, maybe a little bit. Uh, we won't be talking about that today, uh, but what we will be talking about is natural service. And so by far the simplest option uh, for breeding your cow herd um, uh, but it's going to be up to you as young producers or, or people interested in this industry uh, or managing some kind of herd. It's going to be up to you to really evaluate some of these options uh, and determine based on your production goals, what system is going to work best for your herd um, on a financial basis, on a labor basis. Uh, for a lot of different reasons, uh, you need to figure out which one is going to work best for you. So. What is natural service? We keep saying natural service, what is it? Uh, really, really simple uh, definition is using live bulls to breed cows as they naturally show heat. So this is putting a bull out on pasture or out in a pen with cows and letting the bull do his job to get cows pregnant. Um, this has minimal uh, human, uh, human factors with this and we'll talk some pros and cons as we go along. Um, so essentially you're letting bulls and cows do what they're going to do. Um, what we need to do though is we need to keep in mind the cow and the bull leading up to the breeding season um, and make sure that we're managing them correctly so that they're going to uh, perform uh, as reproductively as, as good as, uh, as they're supposed to. And we have something in the chat here. I don't know if this is AI recording, sorry, somebody's looking for AI recordings from last session, I believe there are, sorry to interrupt there. Um, so jump into the next one here. My advance isn't really working. Okay, starting with the cow. So again, there's two uh, big points to this formula, our cow and our bull. So let's talk about the cow. Uh, what do we need to make sure uh, we're doing uh, with our cows leading up to breeding uh, to ensure good reproductive or, or uh, uh, yeah, good reproductive success, I guess I'll put that. Um, so a couple things that we need to consider. And I know this was talked about last week a little bit as well, um, but it's extremely important because ultimately we can't have good reproduction without solid nutritional plans. Um, and so we need to make sure our cows are in a good uh, or a proper nutritional status. Uh, that's considering body condition score uh, and relative plane of nutrition. We'll talk about that here uh, in the next slide. Uh, but having our cows in good condition uh, allows uh, other things like establishment of a new pregnancy to actually occur. Uh, so yeah, talk about that in a moment. Um, also, if we're considering heifers, we need to make sure our heifers have reached puberty uh, or are really close to reaching puberty. Um, pretty simply put, we wanna make sure that our heifers uh, are pubertal by about a year of age. Um, there's a lot of things that go into that, uh, but essentially, uh, if, our, if our heifers are ready to breed uh, shortly after they turn uh, a year of age, uh, and, and we know that our heifers are pubertal when they're going into breeding, uh, we would hope that those heifers uh, would breed early in the breeding season and thus calve earlier in the calving season. Uh, there's a lot of work that talks about uh, cows that calve earlier, cows that breed within the first 21 days of the breeding season tend to stay in the herd longer um, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, but primarily, uh, those cows that are having calves early in the calving season, uh, those calves are a lot bigger uh, than calves that are born way, way late in the season. Uh, and then there's also some evidence that uh, talks about cattle getting rebred again. Uh, if they have a little bit more time in between calving and the next breeding season, they typically have uh, a little better pregnancy success uh, going into that next breeding season. Uh, and that kind of gets us into that third point there, uh, talking about days postpartum at the start of the breeding season. So I've got a slide that talks uh, a, about that in a little bit more detail. Um, but essentially when we put this out on a calendar, uh, 45 days postpartum is really what we're shooting for at the start of a breeding season. If we want to uh, have a calf out of a cow every 365 days. So if we do just briefly, if we do some math on that, uh, 365 days uh, minus our gestation length, let's just say 280 days. So that puts us at, what is that, 85 days that we have 
from having a calf to getting pregnant again. And if we have a 45 day postpartum period, that means we have 40 days to get a cow pregnant again. Um, and so at a minimum, we want 45 days uh, postpartum for cows at the start of the breeding season uh, for, for a lot of different reasons. Um, but recovery of those uh, reproductive organs is a big thing. Uh, uterine involution is what it's called. Essentially, it's a fancy word for getting the uterus and the, the female reproductive tract uh, healed and shrunk back down to its its normal size after having a calf uh, and, and returning to estrus and being able to breed again. Um, also, some things about cows uh, going into breeding. Um, it's, it seems that calves or cows that really struggle having a calf uh, that spring uh, will have a little bit more trouble getting pregnant again. Uh, potentially that's, that's because they need a little bit more time to heal uh, and maybe some other things as well. But uh, generally from a, from a welfare standpoint, from a, from a cow health standpoint, and rebreeding standpoint as well, uh, having cows that calve on their own, uh, that calve easy is, is definitely preferred to uh, ones that we're gonna have C-sections and, and really difficult pulls on. Okay, so I mentioned body conditions for a little bit. Uh, and yeah, I know you talked about this last week, so we'll keep it pretty brief. Um, and so body condition scores uh, are on a scale from one to nine in beef cattle. Uh, and so we've got a, a couple different ones here shown. You can see this girl on the top would be considered uh, a body condition score one. Uh, that heifer, that cow in the middle is about a five. Uh, and that cow on the bottom, would be a nine uh, in the body in terms of body condition score. Um, and so what kind of what we need to think about when it comes to body condition score uh, is really the when it when it comes down to nutrient partitioning of this animal. And what that is 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 it's a fancy way of saying uh, how will nutrients go to certain functions or certain organs in the body uh, based on that condition of that animal? Uh, and when what are the priorities of where those nutrients will go? And so uh, top priority for an animal when it comes to where am I delivering nutrients to my body is maintenance. We need to support basal metabolism. We need to keep our body functioning. Lower on that priority list is the establishment of a new pregnancy. So essentially, uh, if we're not in a good body condition uh, as a cow and we're working really, really hard just to maintain uh, our, our body metabolism and our body functions, uh, the last thing on that cow's mind or from a from that cow's body, I guess, is, is the establishment of a new pregnancy. So getting a cow pregnant in a body condition score one, for example, is going to be really, really tough. Uh, similar things are happening when you have uh, overly obese cows. Uh, definitely will run into some issues with fertility uh, and things like that. But Generally speaking, we want our cows uh, somewhere in a body condition score five to six, uh, and ultimately that's going to uh, have the greatest fertility uh, in terms of what do her body, what is her de body demanding in terms of maintenance, uh, is her body adequate in terms of maintenance, and can she support a new pregnancy going into the breeding season. Also, I just want to throw this in there, uh, and this is talking about uh, the periconceptual period uh, uh, and nutrition during that period, and so. What this period is, is it's this time shortly before conception and shortly after conception. And so what we found in our research, uh, and this is just my little caveat of, of what we do, uh, is that this is a really, really important time, uh, both for that cow and for the establishment of her new pregnancy. And so uh, there's some there's some evidence that what that cow is eating, uh, how her new, how her uh Nutrition, what her nutrition looks like kind of going into the breeding season can set up a lot of things actually for that calf uh, as early as, as you know, that time of maternal recognition of pregnancy, which happens uh, just at a couple weeks uh, post conception. And so what we call those are some programming impacts. And so uh, it's essentially setting up that calf for long term performance and productivity uh, based on what that uh, cow ate slightly before or during that really early pregnancy time period. And so uh, another thing that we need to think about with cows though uh, is days postpartum. And so I mentioned a little bit earlier that 45 days postpartum is really what we wanna shoot for uh, for cows going into the breeding season. Essentially, this is the number of days between giving birth and getting pregnant again. Uh, maybe that's giving birth in, in April and, and becoming pregnant again in July. 
that period in between is your days postpartum. So it's really essential uh, that cows undergo uh, enough time postpartum. Uh, one, their uterus needs to resume normal size uh, and they need to return to estrus. And so what cows do uh, and what a lot of species do is they go through this period of anesterous, it's called. So they're not cycling. Uh, usually when cattle are, are nursing a suckling calf, they're not cycling. And so establishing a new pregnancy during this period where they're, they're not having an estrus cycle is going to be obviously really difficult. Uh, and so that day's postpartum period is really important uh, to get that cow cycling again and get her ready to accept a new pregnancy. There's also some things going on uh, in terms of uh, kind of that nutrient partitioning aspect, kind of how uh, cattle uh, mobilize their fat stores and mobilize their energy stores uh, and kind of what their demands are in terms of production during this period uh, in, in those postpartum days after calving. Uh, essentially their requirements to milk that calf shoot way up. Um, and so fat stores are mobilized to supply milk to that calf. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot of things happening there in terms of energy demands uh, and energy that she's actually getting delivered into the feed. But uh, generally uh, speaking, if we have more days postpartum, uh, so if a cow has more time to recover between calving and getting pregnant again, we have more time for uterine repair uh, and a better chance that these cows are gonna be returning to estrus. Therefore, uh, we'd hope for some greater pregnancy rates. And I see a bunch of chats coming in, so I might just take a moment. Thanks, Travis. Good answer. Um, all right, jumping in here. Uh, so talked a little bit about cows. Uh, now we need to talk about bulls. Um, and this is probably a point that, um, or the section that didn't get talked about with AI, um, obviously because there's uh, less of a need for live cover bulls uh, if you're using AI services. Uh, nevertheless, there's still gonna be a need for, for natural service bulls at some point or another though. So definitely some things to talk about here uh, in terms of uh, bull factors. We've got a couple things uh, that we need to address. Uh, one, uh, we need to consider the age of our bull battery, uh, the age of our bulls that we have on hand. Uh, we'll talk here uh, in a moment, but yearling bulls act very differently and perform differently than mature bulls. Uh, so that's something that we need to recognize uh, when it comes to selecting bulls that we're going to have breeding our cows uh, or breeding heifers. Um, next, we're going to talk about uh, breeding soundness exams. Um, this is a very, very important piece to using natural service uh, and a very good option for you as managers or future managers to look into uh, as a way to kind of put some insurance uh, on your reproductive uh, breeding pro or on your breeding programs. Uh, so you have an idea of how your bulls will be performing out on uh, pasture out in the pens with your cows. Uh, something we also need to consider with our bulls is their libido. Uh, what is their drive to mate? Do they have a drive to mate? Uh, ultimately, we could have uh, a bull with the best semen characteristics, the best semen quality, but if he has no desire to mount a cow, that doesn't do much for us uh, if that's his job uh, out with the cows uh, uh, during the breeding season. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about some stocking rates and give some uh, natural service kind of breeding recommendations. Um, so you have an idea of how you would actually incorporate a natural service breeding system uh, into your herd. Okay, so I mentioned, uh, mentioned a little bit about how uh, different ages of bulls uh, act a little bit differently when they're exposed, exposed to cows. And so you'll see here, we've got uh, three different ages of bulls. We've got a yearling bull, so one-year-old, uh, a two-year-old and a three-year-old or over three-year-old bulls. You'll see here uh, on the left, we've got mount services, estrus female service, pregnant uh, females that were serviced and overall pregnancy rates. Uh, you can see on this very, very top line here uh, that uh, yearling bulls are mounting a lot of cows. They're uh, doing lots and lots of mounting out there compared to uh, mature bulls, okay? Kind of interesting look at the next circled uh, line there at the bottom when it comes to uh, pregnant females that were serviced. Um, although yearling bulls are mounting a lot of females, 
their pregnancy rates are a little bit lower. Their pregnancy success uh, is lower than what mature bulls would be achieving on pasture with fewer mounts. Um, and so what this says is that as bulls get older, they have more mating experience. They kind of know the ropes. They know what they're doing. Uh, and so we have uh, a potential for greater pregnancy success. And so uh, something to note, um, and we'll, we'll talk about it in the recommendations here uh, a little bit later, um, but, but it's important to note that with yearling bulls, we don't really know how they're going to act on pasture uh, until they're out there. And so uh, definitely a smart idea. If you've, got a, if you've got a small herd, let's say you've only got 30 cows, uh, probably smart to use a, a, a bull that's experienced, kind of knows what's going on. Uh, might be a little risky throwing out a yearling bull and telling him good luck um, because you might get some things like this. He might be mounting a lot of cows, but he might not be doing much uh, just because, yeah, with age comes some experience uh, and some, uh, some pregnancy success as well. Okay, so what makes a good bull? How do we pick a good bull? Oh, right, hold on. I'm gonna interrupt you quick. We had a couple oh. of timely questions. So oh, one yeah, of them yeah. is, can you prevent toxemia in heifers? On our ranch, we had a similar problem where heifers would transfer too many nutrients to the calf and later die. Is there a scientific way for this or a way to stop it? Oh, that's a good question. Toxemia. Ah, I don't know. That's a really good question. I'm, I don't have an answer for that one. I might have to look into that. I don't know if anybody else might, uh, might have an idea about that, but I'm not, not entirely sure on that one, Madeline. And so uh, then our next question is, so, ca so cows can be exposed to bulls while their calves are still inside. Yes. Yes. And often that's, uh, that's the scenario. So if we think of uh, a production calendar, what's happening uh, on the ranch. So calves are typically getting weaned around six to seven months of age. Um, so let's say we're calving in April. Uh, and remember, we need that 80 days to get pregnant again with that next calf. So that puts us somewhere mid-summer. So yeah, absolutely. Cows are, are becoming pregnant with their next calf while their last calf is still nursing at side. Good question. Good point there, Travis, as well. Yeah, bulls have very, very different libido uh, and you kind of need to watch them and we'll get to that here uh, in a second. But yeah, one of the most important pieces uh, of determining if your bull is being successful is watching him uh, to see that he's actually doing his job. Uh, thanks for catching me, Jill, on that. I've got my chat here on the left and my presentation in front of me. So if I, uh, if I miss some questions, just holler at me. Um, so uh, what makes a good bull? Um, so there's a couple things that we need to think about. Um, one, the probably pretty obvious one is he needs to be reproductively sound. Um, and what that means is his swimmers need to be good. He, he needs to have modal and morphologically normal sperm. Uh, that means his sperm needs to be moving. It needs to be alive uh, and it needs to be shaped correctly uh, in order to get to the egg. That's the one job of the sperm. It needs to find the egg. And so uh, if that sperm doesn't move correctly, it's not moving in the right direction. Uh, there can be some issues with fertility uh, that show up when you preg check cows later on. Uh, likely in the fall if you're if you've got a spring calving cow herd. Um, some other things uh, in addition to reproductive soundness. Um, oh, we've, I guess I should address this. Scrotal circumference uh, for bull age is really important too. Um, I don't have numbers here to go along with this uh, in terms of uh, minimum, maximum scrotal circumference measurements. Um, but essentially scrotal circumference is, is related to fertility. Um, and so we need to make sure that our bulls are, are developing uh, reproductively in terms of uh, male sex organs uh, and that kind of thing uh, for their age. And I see another question here. Okay, Travis addressed that one. Um, okay, so then in terms of physical soundness, so um, a lot of things that we need to keep in mind for a bull. Uh, and these might be pretty obvious, but sometimes we forget about them. Uh, we need to make sure that a bull is physically sound in terms of his feet and legs. Um, anybody know, or I guess anybody who's seen a cow or a bull at work with the cows knows that he's got to stand up on his back two feet to mount a cow. If a bull can't do that, we're gonna have some trouble. Um, if a bull can't physically move around uh, in a pasture to get to the cows, 
he's not going to be a very good breeder. Uh, he's not going to be very efficient, uh, or very effective at getting the job done if he can't get himself around to find the cows. Okay. So feet, legs, um, but also uh, an exam of his external sex organs is going to be really important. Uh, bulls can get hurt really easily. Um, there's some nasty injuries out there, um, but essentially, whether it's it's damage to the to the scrotum uh, with frostbite in the winter, um, that's not a new thing. That's not unheard of in North Dakota. Uh, it's definitely something that we need to be aware of. So damage to the scrotum, uh, damage to the penis as well. Some bulls uh, can really get some nasty injuries uh, or have some diseases or infections. Um, and so the, the, the physical soundness of those external sex organs is definitely something that needs to be uh, evaluated as well. And finally, uh, bulls, as I mentioned uh, earlier, bulls need to have libido. Uh, bulls need to have a desire to mate. Um, they could have, again, they could have the best semen uh, that you've ever seen, but if they have no desire to hang out with the cows uh, or think about the ladies like this guy is doing in this picture, um, then he's not doing much as a breeder, okay? Got another question. Genetics to determine libido, is that progeny difference or estimated? I. I'm somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that there's any EPDs uh, that estimate libido. Uh, yeah, thanks, Travis. Um, all you got to do is watch. Um, and that's what's going to be really, really important as a manager. Uh, what we'll talk about here uh, in the next couple slides. Um, we, could, we talk about natural service being low input, kind of low labor, um, but it's just important for you as a manager to watch your cattle watch breeding happening um, because yeah if your bulls are sitting down by the water just enjoying the summer sun uh, kind of soaking up the rays they are not doing anything for you um, and so definitely just need to watch bulls watch them in action uh, and see that they're actually interested in the cows uh, I don't know that there's anything that you can do to fix libido um, I'm not really sure there might be something as bulls increase in age you might see that libido kind of get established uh, I I'm not 100% sure on that. Uh, I'd have to do a little bit of, of, of research into that, but interesting thought there. Uh, good question. Um, okay, so breeding soundness exams. A uh, really important thing that we can do as managers to see if our bulls are going to be effective um, when it comes time for the breeding season. And so I, I'll add to, um, even if you're doing AI, even if you're doing um, you know, a heat detection AI method or, or a fixed time AI, uh, there's a good chance that you might need a cleanup bowl um, at the conclusion of those uh, uh, breeding programs as well. Um, and so uh, what's really, really important is that you do a breeding soundness exam uh, on bulls that are be that are going to be uh, your breeding stock. Uh, so you can see what the sperm quality, what the semen quality is actually looking like. Uh, and you can kind of predict fertility uh, and how successful this bull is going to be uh, with the cows by doing this breeding soundness exam. And so this is something that's done on a yearly basis. Um, a lot of veterinarians do this. Um, I don't think you have to be a veterinarian to do this, um, but pretty typical to call your vet's office, take some bulls in, or maybe have the vet come to you uh, and do some breeding soundness exams uh, on your herd sires. Um, biggest thing with breeding soundness exams, doesn't tell you how they're going to be, how they're going to act in terms of behavior, in terms of libido with their cows. You have to observe that. Um, simply a breeding soundness exam is only an evaluation of uh, reproductive, um, reproductive soundness in terms of sperm quality, uh, external sex organs, and then some uh, physical evaluation is going to be included as well. Um, so kind of uh, good timing of doing this is somewhere four to six weeks. Uh, before the start of the breeding season. It's important though, uh, to give yourself enough time with breeding soundness exams in case a bull fails. Um, bulls fail breeding soundness exams all the time. Um, what you need to do is have a backup plan. If you have 30 cows and you only have one bull and he fails, what are we gonna do? What's next? So you need to make sure that you're giving yourself enough time uh, between this breeding soundness exam and the start of your breeding season in the case that you need to retest a bull uh, or you need to go out uh, and buy a new herd sire uh, because uh, your trusty Rusty just failed. So some things that are included in this breeding soundness exam, scrotal measurements, uh, again, semen collection, physical evaluation, and any pre-breeding shots. Uh, I don't know if anybody's covering health in the upcoming um, webinars, 
but some bull shots and cow shots pre-breeding, uh, definitely something to look into. I won't address them today, um, but do some research if this is something that you're interested in uh, and see what might be important uh, for the bulls in your area or for your herd. Um, and so essentially at the end of a breeding soundness exam though, a bull can be classified as satisfactory, uh, questionable or a, or a fail. Um, and so this, this is just a little table showing uh, what that satisfactory and questionable um, uh, rating actually mean. When it comes to these bulls, breeding cows, uh, satisfactory bulls, uh, somewhere a 45% pregnancy rate in this in this specific study. This is an older study, 1989, this one was done. Uh, and bulls that tested uh, and were deemed questionable at the end of breeding soundness exams only had about a 36% uh, percent pregnancy rate. So uh, when a vet or whoever is doing your breeding soundness exams says a bull is questionable, that, questionable, uh, that bull is probably questionable. Uh, and it might, uh, might be an indicator of how that bull is actually gonna perform uh, during the breeding season. Hey, Jennifer. So a couple yeah. quick questions back to our BSE. Okay. So if bulls fail the first time, how, how long do you have to wait to retest them? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, there's a lot of different answers out there. Oh, shoot. Someone might correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm thinking it's, it's somewhere around that four weeks, uh, that you need to retest. Uh, I could be wrong there. I might need to double check on that number. Essentially, what's what we need to keep in mind is is how long that uh, the lifespan of that sperm is. Um, and I, I I should have that number offhand, but I don't. Uh, but essentially, when you want to retest when a new batch of that sperm is is coming through, uh, you know, maybe there is something environmentally. Maybe it was frostbite on the scrotum. Maybe uh, maybe it was just a it was a it was a poor round. Um, and he needs to get retested and he needs to generate some new sperm to get a more accurate uh, representation of the semen that he's got. Uh, but yeah, that's a that's a good question. I would have to double check into that number. Sorry, I don't have that one with me. Okay, um, a little more on uh, some BSE. So some things that we can find when we do a breeding soundness exam. Um, so obviously these aren't, these aren't normal sperm. Um, and so if something like this comes up, Obviously, that person doing the breeding soundness exam uh, would would deem a bull questionable uh, or or a fail if you see a lot of these abnormalities. Um, and so uh, these are just some morphological defects. So what's keeping that sperm from actually getting to the egg? Um, so maybe these sperm move, uh, but do they move in the right in the right direction? Uh, are they actually progressively modal? Are they getting to uh, the egg like they're supposed to? And these are just some common ones uh, that I've seen. Um, so we've got proximal droplets here. Essentially, there's this little water droplet uh, on the far left between the, uh, the head and the tail. And that water droplet is supposed to shed off the tail of that sperm, uh, but it gets stuck on there. And so has, that sperm has some uh, trouble advancing and moving as it should. Uh, to to uh, fertilize the egg. We also have some coiled tails. You see uh, that second image, that tail is kind of all wrapped around itself. Uh, that sperm is gonna uh, struggle with moving as well. Um, some abnormal head and bent mid pieces. Again, uh, really just, just some issues with movement uh, and getting to that egg and fertilizing it uh, is what's gonna cause uh, some of these bulls uh, to be called questionable or even fail if there's a great enough concentration of these abnormal um, sperm cells. And then last, uh, detached heads, obviously no tail, uh, no way of that sperm moving. And so obviously that's not going to do much good uh, when it comes to uh, getting deposited in the cow and trying to make it uh, to the egg. So I see a question. Ah, six weeks. Thanks, Travis. Um, okay, so why else would a bull fail a BSE? Um, obviously, morphological defects uh, are a big one, but this is a comparison talking about yearling bulls and mature bulls. Um, and so we mentioned yearling bulls and mature bulls behave a little bit differently uh, out on uh, out during the breeding season with cows or heifers, uh, but sometimes they also fail breeding soundness exams for different reasons. Um, and so you'll see yearling bulls are in the in the green bars here, mature bulls are in the yellow bars. Um, so you'll notice that yearling bulls will fail uh, breeding soundness exams uh, in terms of morphological defects uh, more than mature bulls. 
Um, however, we see a little bit of difference um, when we're talking about abnormalities in terms of some external sex organs. Um, and so mature bulls uh, tend to fail breeding soundness exams uh, for, for abnormalities or injuries to the penis as well compared to yearling bulls. Uh, this is for some pretty obvious reasons. Uh, mature bulls are, are out on pasture, they're out working. Uh, they've, they've been in the field a little bit longer and so there's a better chance that they, uh, they might've gotten hurt somewhere along the way. Um, some warts on those sex, external sex organs, uh, those can be some issues. A lot of times you can cut those off or a vet can cut those off and that bull can still be functional. Uh, decided not to put any images of that up uh, for your guys' sake uh, this time, but uh, any of these kind of injuries or, or abnormalities to the male reproductive system uh, for beef cattle, you can look and, and, and some of these are, are pretty gnarly looking, but you can check them out because they absolutely do happen. Um, Interestingly, we have some differences in terms of mature bulls and yearling bulls uh, for those failing breeding soundness exams in terms of foot and leg structure. Um, and then scrotal circumference as well. Uh, pretty, um, pretty evident here that, that yearling bulls are failed uh, more often for scrotal circumference issues compared to mature bulls. Uh, essentially, what this might mean is that uh, at the time of breeding soundness exams, these yearling bulls just aren't sexually mature enough or haven't reached the uh, scrotal circumference that they need uh, that corresponds with their age uh, to, can be, to be considered good breeders. And so they might fail a uh, breeding soundness exam for that reason. Um, but essentially uh, kind of big, big picture and, and what I want you to take away from this um, is that a lot of these defects and a lot of these abnormalities are really hard to pick out if you're not doing a breeding soundness exam. Um, sure, some issues with physical structure, maybe that's uh, some bad feet, some bad toes, uh, bad legs, whatever. You might be able to see that uh, when that cow or when that bull's out on pasture. Uh, but these others, especially issues with sperm quality uh, and, and other issues with that external uh, uh, male reproductive tract, you're really not going to see unless you do a breeding soundness exam. Um, or until your cows show up in the fall and they're open uh, because the bull wasn't doing its job. So just some, some big picture things to keep in mind there. Um, again, behavior is super variable. Um, for the most part though, uh, a bull will mount a cow uh, and service her somewhere between one and 27 times. Um, and so with that, it's really important that uh, a bull is physically sound, uh, can actually do the work, stand on his back two legs uh, to do that. And so a bull somewhere is, is mounting a cow and servicing a cow uh, around four times on average uh, till she becomes pregnant. Um, uh, also, uh, bulls will tend to seek out uh, more receptive females at the start of the breeding season uh, and find females that are in standing estrus. What's really interesting uh, with the cow estrus cycle uh, is that the estrus cycle is 21 days. And so at any point uh, during, the, during that 21 day period, 5% of your herd should be in standing heat, should be in estrus. Uh, and so uh, typically though, uh, bulls will uh, service uh, far more times or mount uh, females far more times than there are actually uh, number of females, if that makes any sense. Um, but bulls become a little bit less selective as the breeding season progresses. Uh, as some of those cows who are in standing heat uh, became pregnant or no longer cycling or no longer in heat, uh, they become a little bit less selective as the breeding season goes on. If the bulls are still interested in those females, maybe, maybe they're showing estrus, maybe they're not, uh, but they'll uh, still continue to service those females as the breeding season goes on. And so um, some recommendations here uh, in terms of bull stocking rates and length of the breeding season, and probably the most important slide to walk away from um, if, if this is something that you're hoping to take back to your herd uh, or something to keep in mind, keep on the back burner for a little bit later uh, in your uh, beef, uh, beef industry careers. And so what we need out of a good breeding bull uh, for natural service breeding uh, or, or really a cleanup bull for that for that matter as well, if you're doing a little bit of AI. Um, so obviously we need our bulls to pass a breeding soundness exam. We need to have uh, a score of satisfactory uh, from a vet or whoever is, is, is experienced in doing breeding soundness exams for your bulls. Your bulls need to have a high libido. They need to be interested in the cows. 
Um, if they're not interested in the cows, it really doesn't matter how good he is. Um, so we need to make sure that he has an interest in doing his job as a bull uh, and is mounting cows and is successful in doing so. Okay, some stocking rates. Uh, if you're just doing natural service, again, yearlings behave a little bit differently than mature bulls. Uh, we maybe don't want to trust yearlings with a big, big group of cows. Uh, their first time out, their first time out on the road. So uh, yearlings, uh, one yearling bull for 15 cows uh, or 15 heifers is, is adequate. For mature bulls, however, uh, we can do one bull for 25, even 30 cows, uh, and we can be okay. Now, if you're synchronizing females, uh, and we didn't talk about synchronization programs for natural service at all today, uh, but it's something that you might want to look into. Uh, if you still want to do some synchronization but don't want to AI, you can set up some cows to be synchronized for natural service. Um, however, as I mentioned, uh, at any given time during a 21-day period, 5% of your herd, 5% uh, of your cow herd would be in estrus. Now, if you're synchronizing those cows, obviously more of them would be in estrus at the same time. Uh, that estrus would be synchronized. It would be a little more concentrated. Uh, and so if your bull can only cover 5% of your herd at a time, you're obviously gonna need to increase your bull power uh, to cover those synchronized females and make sure um, that your females that are coming into heat are actually getting serviced by your bull uh, instead of waiting another 21 days for that ne next estrus cycle to roll around. Okay, uh, with that, we want uh, at a minimum, just a good recommendation uh, is a 42 day breeding season. That means bulls have access to the cows for a 40 day to 42 day period. So that's two estrus cycles. That's two 21 day periods. Uh, essentially you're giving cows uh, two chances to become pregnant uh, during those, uh, or two big chances to become pregnant during those estrus cycles. Um, some folks leave bulls in for a lot longer, some a little bit shorter. Um, it's kind of up to you uh, and how selective you want to be about your, uh, your most fertile females and, and really how close or how tight you want that calving window to be um, for how long you leave your bulls out with the cows. Essentially, we want to watch bulls closely as the breeding season progresses. Um, that's not necessarily going out and watching the bull the first day that he sees the cows um, and seeing that he's going to mount a couple. And that's watching the bull throughout the breeding season. Uh, bulls can get hurt. Bulls can hurt a foot. Uh, bulls can get caught up in a fence. Uh, who knows what um, throughout the breeding season. And so uh, it's really important that you check up on them as the breeding season goes on uh, in case he's come down with an injury uh, or, or is struggling to breed cows somewhere uh, in the middle of that breeding season. It's better to catch that early and get a new bull in, uh, in with that group of cows uh, instead of finding out uh, much later when it comes to preg checking uh, that that bull really didn't do his job. And in general, we wanna have a backup plan. Uh, what happens if our bull uh, fails a breeding soundness exam, uh, gets hurt in the middle of the breeding season, uh, we need to have a backup plan so that we can still uh, get good pregnancy rates in our cows. I've got a question. Yep, thanks Travis. Travis said, if you choose to synchronize, bull battery needs to be greater. Uh, absolutely, because more of those cows will be in asterisk at the same time. Uh, and that's gonna be a lot of work for a bull um, to cover all these cows that are that are in heat at the same time. Okay, um, so almost finished here. I've got just a couple more slides left. I know I'm, I'm pushing time just a little, um, but just some general herd expectations. And these are some really good benchmarks to go off of, uh, kind of no matter what your herd size, these are just some really good uh, markers uh, to see if your herd is doing well. Okay, so obviously we want a calving to calving interval every 365 days, or uh, we want that interval to be 365 days. We want a calf on the ground every 365 days. This means cows need to have a calf and get rebred somewhere between 80 and 85 days. Okay, um, we didn't talk really about cull cows, uh, but the hope is to keep cows in the herd who are calving or are getting pregnant early in the breeding season, therefore calving earlier in the calving season. Um, and, we're, and we're culling only about 5% of cows uh, that don't become pregnant or, or maybe cows that, uh, that have some reasons why they might not be getting pregnant that next breeding season. Uh, hopefully over 95% of cows will wean a calf. Um, some more things here about uh, heifers and heifer replacements, which we didn't really talk about, uh, but kind of another point that I'll talk about here though is, is the length of our calving window. 
And so uh, the length of your calf calving season is really up to you as a producer um, and what, what pregnancy rate you want, what kind of calving season you can actually handle from a labor standpoint, from a timing standpoint. There's a lot of things that are gonna go into this. And so kind of what we want, a good benchmark is to condense our calving season to 42 days. Uh, and I'm sure you know folks out there, uh, you know, we've had it at home. I can't say our ranch is perfect at home. Uh, sometimes we, we condense all our calving to March and April, and sometimes we have a straggler out in, out in late May. It happens. Uh, and, and, and I'm sure you guys have seen it before, uh, but really our goal is to, to concentrate our calving season um, to 42 days, two cycles, to increase the uniformity of our calf crop and potentially do a little bit better at sale if our calves are looking a little more alike uh, when it comes to that time. Okay, and finally, uh, there's some things that I mentioned, there's a, there's a third aspect to that formula and that's the people factor. Um, and so uh, granted, this is a much, much bigger part if you're doing AI but definitely some things that we need to think about from a handling standpoint and from a welfare standpoint uh, that apply to uh, uh, really all methods uh, of breeding programs that you're gonna, that you might be implementing. Okay, so what can you control from a people standpoint? Uh, one, as managers, we can test bulls ahead of time and we have a backup plan. Uh, that one's a little bit different than the, than the other options here, um, but calm handling. Absolutely a good thing to do, uh, whether you're doing natural service, whether you're doing AI, keeping cattle um, calm, uh, implementing low stress handling options uh, is, is all around a, a good option for, um, for animal health, for animal welfare, uh, but also animals who are really, really stressed at the time of breeding or stressed around breeding. Uh, we tend to have some issues with reproductive success as well. So just some general thoughts, reduce noise, reduce stress, Try and keep the hot shot away if you can, uh, but a really good thing to do, whether you're running cattle through uh, a shoot maybe five times with an AI protocol uh, or maybe just maybe just a time going out to pasture uh, to breed is you want to make sure cattle are acclimated to the system, uh, that working system, uh, so we can follow some of those low stress handling options as well. And I see a couple of chats. Should your bull be taller than his cows or can he be, can he be smaller? Um, that's a good question. Uh, most bulls are taller than the cows. Um, what it comes down to is his ability to reach uh, what he needs to reach, uh, if that makes any sense at all. Uh, if your bull is, is trying to mount cows that are much, much bigger, much framier than him, uh, and, he's, and simply the, the act of copulation is unsuccessful, uh, then there's gonna be some problems. Uh, if he can reach the cow, if he can get where he needs to go, uh, then I don't see a problem with it. Uh, but something that you might want to observe if your bulls are actually out there uh, breeding uh, cows that are much taller than him. Okay, a couple more here. For natural breeding, is it recommended not to sink? Because don't want everyone to be an estrus at once. Good question. Um, it's an option for you. Uh, you can absolutely synchronize cows if you're going to do natural service, uh, or you can let them do what they want. You can just turn the bull out uh, with the cows for a couple of cycles uh, and let the bull cover the cow as she comes into natural heat. Um, lots of ways that you can do it, and I'll kind of, that's actually a really good bridge into this slide, uh, and we'll talk about some pros and cons of natural service. Okay, so why might we do natural service? Uh, one, it's probably a little bit cheaper than AI. Um, depending, of course, depending on how much you're willing to pay for a live cover bull. Um, paying $4,000 for a bull uh, and $14,000 for a bull uh, is a, looks a little bit different on paper. And so some definitely um, some things you might wanna work out from an economical analysis standpoint uh, to see what actually that's gonna cost you on a per pregnancy or a per, uh, per cow basis. Um, also for natural service though, there's less room for human error. Obviously there's less, less shots, um, less equipment, um, less, less fewer times running through the chute uh, as compared to AI. Uh, and so there's less room as for humans to mess it up. Uh, I guess that's a really simple way to put it. Um, with that, less labor goes into using natural service, less facilities and equipment needed uh, to utilize a natural service program. Of course, um, as that individual mentioned, we can synchronize 
uh, cows for natural service. And that's going to take a little more labor, a little more, a uh, little more uh, work from a human standpoint, but absolutely something that we can do. Um, some cons for a natural service and just some things to think about. Um, obviously, this is the low labor, a uh, low intensity kind of option. Uh, but what we what we struggle with with natural service uh, is we maybe are a little bit more limited in terms of uh, live bulls that have the genetic profiles that you want. Uh, maybe a little less selective about what bull you can use just based on what you can get uh, at a production sale uh, or from somebody you know who sells uh, sells breeding bulls or maybe even uh, some bulls that you've retained from your own herd. Um, obviously, you're going to need more live bulls if you're not using AI. Um, and there's a cost associated with maintenancing bulls throughout the year. Uh, potentially, there's some a uh, little bit less hybrid vigor, maybe uh, if you're using some some maybe some outcross bulls uh, with an AI sire compared to uh, maybe some live bulls. There might be some differences there in terms of hybrid big, hybrid vigor. Um, also, if we've got our our calving season spread out a little bit and we're kind of just letting bulls uh, breed cows as they come into natural heat our calving season might be a little less concentrated uh, as opposed to maybe we're breeding all of our cows on a fixed time AI and we're breeding all of our cows over a three-day period. Obviously, our, our calving season is going to look a little bit different. Uh, maybe that's a pro for you. Maybe that's actually going to work for you depending on uh, the labor that you have or the help that you have during calving, uh, but all very, very important things to think about. Now, I did have some slides uh, on pregnancy detection, but I think I'm going to skip those today. I, I'm running way low on time. Um, so I'll, I'll fast forward through those. Uh, but absolutely, if anybody has any questions, I will uh, end on that slide there um, and address some questions as they come up. Okay, so we have one. Is it okay to use the hotshot once in a while? Good question. Um, what I would say to that um, is, yep, it's okay once in a while. Um, a good response though, or kind of a good thing to keep in mind uh, is that a hot shot maybe just shouldn't be used as a primary driving tool. Um, there's lots of other ways to move cattle that are low stress, um, but when it comes down to it, yes, sometimes a hot shot's okay uh, in, a, in a kind of dire situation when uh, maybe it comes down to a well-being of the animal uh, or, or a person or, or another animal. Yes, yeah, sometimes a hot shot is needed. Yeah, good question. Okay, did we have another one? I think we got that one. Okay, while we are waiting for questions to trickle in, I'm gonna launch a poll and just see if you guys have any questions you want answered or any uh, that kind of stuff, okay? Someone asked on here, Jill, is this presentation recorded and where might it be accessible or is that sent out to the attendees at some point? It is recorded and I will, you wrote down your email. I can send you the recording once I get it tomorrow. Okay, I've got another question on here. Do you recommend having all yearling bulls together for breeding or have at least one mature bull? Um, good question, Taylor. Um, so there's some things to think about in terms of mingling bulls, uh, and it comes down to dominance. And so um, if you put some, some new bulls all together, you'll notice they start fighting right away. Um, and sometimes they'll fight for quite a while. And so um, there might be some dominance issues if you're mixing yearling bulls with mature bulls. Um, and so if you've got the facilities that can handle some bulls fighting a little bit, uh, it might not be the end of the world. Um, some folks will say that having some mature bulls and yearling bulls mix though, when it comes to actually being out breeding, uh, maybe the yearling bull will kind of learn the ropes from the mature bull. Um, I would say uh, sometimes it's, it's a little risky to just have a yearling bull uh, all by himself, but perhaps if you have some yearling bulls together, uh, kind of bulls of similar age, similar battery, uh, that might be a, that might be a smart idea if you don't want bulls to fight. We also had somebody ask, um, what's your stocking rate for cows per bull for breeding? Oh yeah. Um, so for, uh, yearling bulls, um, we'd like to do one yearling bull for 15 cows. 
And then for mature bulls, we can do one bull for 25 to 30 cows. Okay, and another question, if you have multiple bulls, is it possible one could be injured and put out of commission from fighting? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's kind of a risk when it comes to mingling bulls uh, who maybe haven't been around uh, one another or introducing new bulls. Yeah, fighting can absolutely be an issue. Um, and so, yeah, definitely something to think about when you're maybe buying new bulls and tossing them in the big bull pen at home. Uh, they might get beat up a little bit. They might take them out of commission for breeding. Um, so some things to think about for sure, if you're bringing on new bulls in the place, uh, maybe you want to isolate them. Um, maybe you want to put uh, bulls of the same uh, age together, that kind of thing. Okay, another one. How much does temperament factor in for you when choosing a bull? Um, Great question. Uh, I'm a person who, you know, I, I come from a cow-calf operation um, and I've seen far too many cows um, who are a little too high strung, uh, cause injury to other people or risk causing injury to other people. Um, to me, and, and you'll hear different answers from different folks, uh, but for me, it's not worth it. Um, you might have a really, really good bull, uh, but if he's endangering folks, uh, uh, their well-being, their lives. Uh, to me, it's not worth it. Um, other people might have different answers to that, uh, but for me, temperament is a is a really big deal when it comes to choosing a bull because that's the that's the well-being and the safety of my people helping me uh, and my safe my safety as well. Good question, Catherine. Um, Faith, if the bull gets injured, will that affect the calf? Um. Are you talking, Faith, maybe you want to clarify uh, on that question. Uh, what calf are you maybe talking about? Is that when the bull is breeding, if he gets injured, will that affect that, that, that fetus? Is that what you're asking? When breeding, sure. Um, I guess maybe a, a way to, to simplify that answer is if a bull gets injured, maybe he's not even able to breed. Um, that's, that's maybe the, the easiest question. Um, if there's nothing wrong, I mean, if the bull hurts his foot and he can still, he can still mount a cow and breed, I don't suspect that there's anything, uh, wrong with that calf, uh, born, you know, at birth or anything like that. Um, but yeah, I guess it comes down to, can that bull actually still breed, um, if he's injured? Okay. Lots of questions. How can you help stop a lot of fighting between your bulls? We have this problem at our farm. Uh, that's probably putting bulls together that are the same age uh, and, uh, and allowing them to establish some dominance. Uh, with bulls, it's kind of a fact of life um, that they're gonna fight. Um, but, but I would say uh, avoid putting a, a five-year-old bull up against a yearling because the, the yearling will kind of get beat up. Um, so I would, my suggestion of that is, is keep bulls together that are close to the same age. And how long do you leave your bulls out with the cows? Uh, good question, Sage. And so um, it kind of varies a lot. Uh, I would say at a minimum, 42 days, uh, leave bulls out with the cows, leave them out for two cycles. Um, some folks will leave them uh, for a lot longer. Some folks will leave them out for a 70 day, 70 day breeding season. Uh, of course, if you think about it, the longer you leave a bull out with the cows, uh, the more chances that cow has to get pregnant while she's while she's in heat, while she's in standing heat, uh, and so your your pregnancy rates will will be a little bit greater as you as you leave bulls out for a longer period of time. But you need to think about what that might do on the on the backside. The, the longer your breeding season, uh, subsequently the longer calving season uh, you'll potentially have. Uh, and Taylor asked, how old should a bull be until you should think about culling? Uh, good question. Um, and so uh, bulls can can be productive and can be fertile for, for a number of years in a herd. Um, I've seen bulls hang around in a herd for four, five, six years, uh, sometimes more. Uh, I would say probably the pro like average productive life of a bull, though, is somewhere between four and six years. Okay, Bella says, when working with your bulls, what type of setup should you typically have? Um, good question. 
Um, so obviously bulls are a little bit more powerful um, than cows. So if you're working bulls, um, if you're handling them, typically they're gonna, they might get a little more aggressive than they would if they're just uh, kind of hanging out in the pasture. Um, and so if you're running bulls through a facility, I would strongly suggest some solid fencing, um, whether that's a continuous panel, whether that's a solid panel, um, whatever. Uh, bulls can can barrel over a, a, a barbed wire fence or a wire fence pretty easily. Um, so definitely something with solid siding. Um, uh, in a if you're testing bulls, uh, that's a little bit of different scenario. That's a little more high stress kind of scenario. Uh, most vet clinics have a a, a good setup. Uh, whether that's a hydraulic chute uh, or a, a, a higher functioning um, manual chute, but definitely some solid uh, sturdy sides is, is preferred for bulls, um, definitely. Got any more? Great question. Okay, is it favorable to have a bull with a more masculine face build or is it not an important characteristic? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, probably a little bit of that goes into, I, I guess to me from a, a reproductive soundness um, standpoint, it, that doesn't really matter uh, to me. Um, there might be some more thought into that though, uh, depending on what kind of offspring you're looking for. Uh, maybe, maybe a bull that has some more masculine characteristics might, might produce some um, some male offspring with masculine characteristics or female might be a little more masculine looking. Um, but from a, from a reproductive performance standpoint, uh, I would say that's maybe not uh, as important of a characteristic. What do you do when a bull won't breed anymore? I'm guessing you don't butcher it and eat it. <laughs> uh, you can. Um, a lot of times uh, bulls that, that uh, fail breeding soundness exams uh, we'll head to uh, the sale barn and go uh, for a coal market. Um, and at, at some point or another, those bulls do end up uh, in a terminal uh, market in a plant um, for, for primary, probably secondary um, uh, beef markets um, uh, as compared to like a finishing animal or something like that. How many cows can a bull cover per season on average? Oh, per season, I guess per season on average, um, they might cover more than you're actually, than you stock them with. Um, uh, that's a, that's a good question. Cause I'm guessing you're looking for a little bit different answer, um, than the actual, just the stocking rate. Uh, but in a, in a 42 day period, we're confident that bulls can, bulls can cover like 25 to 30 cows. Um, but per season, if, if you just let them let him out with a, with a bunch of different cows and said, have at it. I guess I'm not sure the answer on that. Good question though, Taylor. How can you tell if your bull is fat, not fit? I think I'm fat, not fit. <laughs> uh, but that's a, that's a good question. Um, being probably, I would suggest uh, do some work on body condition scores uh, and, and look into how you evaluate an animal properly uh, in relation to body condition scores. There's a number of indicators on an animal uh, that say uh, this animal has got a lot of extra condition or a lot of extra fat cover uh, compared to an animal that doesn't. Um, you know, some some really obvious indicators are some maybe some fat around the tail head, um, some some fat in the brisket area, maybe some fat in the flank. Um, but yeah, I would I would suggest looking into some body condition scoring um, and looking at the indicators within each of those score. Uh, each of those um, score categories to determine if a if a bull has actually got a lot of condition or or if he's muscular. Okay, Brody says, when working bulls, would you use wood or metal panels? Um, I would suggest metal uh, just when it when it comes to sturdiness. Um, some of these bulls are 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 two thousand pounds. Some of them more. Some of them less. Um, a bull that heavy can can absolutely bust down some wood panels if he felt like it. Uh, I guess I would suggest, or I would answer that, Brody, uh, sturdy metal panels uh, would be preferred. Would you consider a masculine face from a calving ease standpoint? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I hadn't thought about that. Um, I guess from, a, from an EPD standpoint, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm sure somebody has a, a, a better answer for that. 
Um, I, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. I'd have to look into that. Is it good to have EPDs on all your bulls or some sort of genetic history? Uh, that's a great question, Bella. Um, I would say record keeping is very, very important when it comes uh, to the success of your reproductive program uh, in your herd. Knowing what bulls uh, throw really big calves uh, or calves that cause cows to have some calving issues is very, very important to know. Um, some genetic lines uh, are, are more prominent with that or, or more, uh, more prone to that. Um, so maybe you can get some EPDs on your bulls. Maybe you can get some kind of performance history at the, at a minimum, uh, and see how these bulls are actually doing when it comes to, uh, generating offspring, uh, and the ease of generating those offspring to uh, all really good things to, to note year after year. Are bulls or cows more dominant when determining genetics for calves? Um, well, uh, a simple way to answer that is a uh, bull is half of the genetics and the cow is half of the genetics. Um, in terms of, uh, oh, I don't know how to, how to answer that anymore. Uh, if there's, if there's certain traits from the bull that are carried through a little bit more, uh, not, not entirely sure. Uh, my background is, is less genetics, uh, as I go here, but, but good question. And, and, uh, maybe a simple way to answer that is, is bulls and cows are 50-50 when it comes to the genetic makeup for that calf. Can heat stress affect breeding? Oh yeah, good question, Faith, absolutely. Um, sometimes we'll, we'll notice in really hot, really dry years, uh, our reproductive performance kind of kind of goes to, uh, can look really, really bad and maybe is the best way to say that. Um, this is maybe observed uh, more often in AI systems uh, or in AI protocols. And when it comes to uh, timing of breeding, uh, breeding early, early in the day to beat the heat keeps that heat stress off of those animals. Uh, but yeah, breeding in the heat of the day uh, can absolutely hurt uh, reproductive success um, for your cows. Uh, I see Travis addressed that question from Catherine. Uh, thanks, Travis. I knew somebody would have a little bit uh, better, uh, better approach on that genetic aspect um, of head shape and kind of shoulder structure and stuff like that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good response um, for sure. Uh, Bella asks, should you have a lot of different genetics in your herd? Um, that's a good question. Depends on what you're after. Um, you can have a lot of similar bloodlines uh, in your herd. And something that you can capitalize on from, from bringing in some different bloodlines or some different genetics is hybrid vigor. Um, and that's something, I don't, I'm not sure if uh, the, the speaker last week talked about that at all um, last week. Um, something important to think about though, uh, with different genetics, maybe you have some different looking cattle, uh, some different performing cattle. Um, when it comes to, to uniformity and selling a calf crop that's, that's similar in weight, similar in design, um, having, having genetics that maybe complement each other uh, or, or, or representative of your herd is, is, is a good idea instead of maybe uh, having some really, really big frame bulls and really, really small frame bulls uh, all breeding the same cow herd. I guess that's how I would answer that one. Are there any red flags you should watch out for when buying a bull? Oh yeah, lots of them. Oh, where should we start? Um, probably goes into uh, a lot of uh, production goals as well with that one. Um, you know, uh, and you kind of have to think, okay, what are what's your selection criteria uh, when it comes to buying a bull? Do you want the biggest frame bull that you can find? Uh, do you want a really small, do you want a calving ease bull that's like, as Travis mentioned, maybe he's really smooth shouldered, uh, gonna be really easy for, uh, for heifers uh, or for cows with a little smaller pelvic area. Um, so yeah, lots of things that you can think about. Maybe it's temperament, uh, maybe it's calving ease. Uh, to me, calving ease sticks out a lot. Um, because my goal uh, as, a, as a beef producer uh, is to have cows that can calve on their own and that calf gets up to nurse uh, right away. Uh, if I'm having uh, cows that are having a very, very hard time calving on their own, typically the vigor of those calves is, is, is hurt a little bit. Those calves struggle to get up um, and those calves might run into some more uh, sicknesses uh, or just struggle with, with vigor later on in life. Um, 
So if you have access to EPDs at all, you kind of just need to think about um, what your goals are as a producer, what can you manage uh, as a producer uh, from a labor standpoint uh, and from a, I guess, from an offspring development standpoint as well. That's probably where I would start with that one. Um, but also uh, I would suggest when you're buying a bull uh, that you buy from somebody who's either gonna test that bull for you uh, or guarantee that bull satisfactory for a test. Uh, I'm, there's, a, there's some producers who will test before the sale, some won't test, uh, but will guarantee it sound. Um, so I would, I would definitely look into that, um, look into some, some production sales, look into some producers. Um, if they're going to back you up, if they if somebody sells you a bull um, and they uh, they're not going to to back you up when that bull fails this first semen test, I would call that a red flag uh, as well. Okay, a couple coming in here. Um, if you have older cows, how old is too old to keep in your herd? Uh, are you talking about cows' faith or bulls? cows? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, and so I, uh, I guess I'll, I'll answer this one maybe with a little story. And so I teach the uh, cow-calf production class um, at NDSU, um, and these students are asked to make uh, ranch plans. So essentially go through all of these things like we're doing today uh, and make a ranch plan and pretty much a, a management plan uh, for lots of these aspects of a cow-calf operation. And sometimes I have students say, well, I'm going to uh, I'm going to sell all my cows when they hit eight years old or when they hit nine years old. Um, there's a number of cows out there in the country that are double that uh, in age. I guess I would say um, I, I would keep a cow around as long as she's productive, as long as she's healthy uh, and, and she's able to raise uh, a, a high performing calf. Uh, now, if, if a cow is 11 years old and she's barely getting around, she's she's struggling to raise her calf, I wouldn't necessarily keep her around anymore. Uh, but there's no saying that your cows can't stay around uh, till they're 12, maybe 13 years old. Uh, if they're still productive, uh, why not? Um, there's some producers who keep cows uh, around. They're just genetically made uh, to be uh, very, very good cows in terms of longevity. Um, so some producers are able to keep cows for, for far, far longer. Uh, but the, the primary reason for selling a cow or for a cow to leave the herd is that she comes up open. Um, and so I would say that that older cows, once they come open, um, maybe, that's, maybe that's their ticket to, to go on down the road uh, and, and find a new place or, or find a cold cow market. So good question. Um, another one here, how much water should your bull be getting every day? And does the weather predict how much water they will drink from day to day? Oh, good question. I don't have that number with me. I don't know if anybody else would have that number of a, how much a, a bull is drinking every day. Um, I don't know. I don't know, Bella. I might have to, I might have to reach out to you after it and get to do some of that information. I do have my email on this last, last page. If you want to send me an email, uh, I can look into that, uh, that number for you. I know what's out there, uh, but I think she asked, uh, that question is, where'd it go? If weather, yeah, definitely in, in times of heat stress, uh, or, uh, periods of really, really hot weather. Yeah. Water in water intake will definitely increase. Okay. I had another one. I've heard the rule, a good bull is worth five of his steer calves. Would you say that that's accurate? Uh, I don't. I don't know. I've never heard that rule before. Uh, maybe I'm. Maybe I'm in the shadows on that one. Uh, I've never. Uh, never heard that rule. So I might have to look into that. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Not sure how to answer that one for you. All right. Anything else? gonna say they had some good questions for you is this is like rapid fire round this is great though should you be putting mineral tubs out or salt blocks uh out into pasture with your cows and bulls oh good travis just answered that that other question for me thanks travis um yeah so uh really good question bella um and so this is where i can put in a little bit more of my caveat too <laughs> uh with the research that our group does uh we're looking specifically at supplementing minerals uh, to cows, uh, 
before and, and during pregnancy. And we found that uh, supplementing mineral to cows uh, is beneficial. Um, what you need to keep in mind uh, as a producer is the cost of doing that. Um, there's some there's some mineral supplements out there that are a little spendy and some that are a little more inexpensive. Um, and so yeah, I, I would suggest walk, walking through that on paper uh, and seeing what's going to work for you from a financial standpoint. But uh, salt blocks, absolutely. Salt is required in the diet. Uh, so I would suggest some salt blocks out there. Uh, but mineral, if that's something that you can that you can float uh, financially, yeah, there, there is benefit to doing that uh, both for cows and bulls. Um, so, yeah. Good question. All right, any more? And while we're waiting for some more questions to come, we know you're waiting on them. Um, if you could take a quick minute and answer the poll questions, that would be much appreciated by all of us. See, Ben, I just had to buy you a few seconds. <laughs> there we go. We got some more. Uh, so Brody's asking, what mineral tubs would you use? Um, good question. So uh, I, unfortunately, I, I'm not here to uh, advocate for any brand uh, or any company, uh, but there's there's a lot of differences out there uh, in terms of uh, supplements, uh, in terms of composition of those supplements. Um, obviously, the, the more ex uh, expensive mineral supplements uh, might be in the form of a, a, an organic or, or a chelated kind of mineral. Um, uh, there's pros, pros to it. There's cons to it. Uh, essentially, if you're using a mineral like that, it's supposed to be more available for the animal uh, when it comes to absorption in the small intestine. And the animal is supposed to, or, uh, the animal should be able to use a little bit more of that, um, that, uh, that mineral compared to uh, some other sources, which we would call inorganic sources. Um, and so I, I would I would suggest that any mineral is better than no mineral. Um, there's there's give and take. There's there's differences in cost uh, with what you're choosing to use. Uh, but I would I would say that yeah, definitely using one is is better than than not using one at all. Now there's a uh, there's a number of of uh, mineral packages out there uh, marketed for. Uh, reproductive performance. Uh, the Avela 4 mineral is one that I'm familiar with, with uh, that's incorporated into a lot of Purina minerals. Um, that one is shown to be successful. Uh, there's a number of them uh, that are good. Uh, but again, it comes down, for me, it comes down to what can you afford? Uh, what can you make work from a financial standpoint? Okay, along with the mineral, is it better to use lick tubs or bags of salt and mineral? Does it make a difference on breeding? Um, good question. So yeah, there's lots of different ways that you can offer free choice mineral. Um, you can offer it in a, in a lick tub. Uh, and usually those are, that's like a cooked tub with molasses. Or you can offer it in a loose form, uh, which is mineral uh, balanced off with some salt to control the intake. Um, really, really good question there. Uh, for sure, the tubs are more convenient. You just drop the tub out uh, and let them let them lick at it slowly. Uh, the design is uh, is a slow intake, uh, so they don't just go crazy on it like they might uh, if they were just given a loose salt with uh, or a loose mineral with no salt. Um, as far as what's out there um, in terms of research, uh, in terms of data uh, of do cows perform better reproductively consuming a tub? or a loose mineral, it's not really out there. Uh, we don't really have an answer to that. Uh, some producers might tell you differently, uh, but coming from a, from a data standpoint, uh, we don't really know uh, if tubs or, or mineral or a loose mineral are, are gonna be better one way or the other. Uh, it's important to, uh, to understand though, uh, the differences that you might see in intake. And so kind of the goal of a, of a free choice mineral is that they're gonna consume a little bit every day. Um, some cows just won't. Um, some cows are, would go to the mineral feeder and sit there all day long. Uh, and some will maybe visit it once a week. Um, and so it's kind of tough when it comes to free choice mineral uh, and making sure that cows are, are consuming that that desired intake every single day. Uh, but I'd kind of close on that. Probably offering a mineral is better than not. Um, and, and your choice of, of tubs uh, or a loose mineral kind of, it comes down to convenience and it comes down to, uh, to cost. Uh, typically tubs are a bit more expensive. 
Um, so just some things to think about there. Is having a nutritionist a good idea or does it depend on how you run your herd? Yeah, absolutely. Having a nutritionist is a good idea. Um, whether that's just somebody to consult with uh, about these kinds of questions exactly, uh, whether it's somebody that's, that's helping you make your rations uh, or being there for some nutrition-based questions. Uh, yeah, having a, having a nutritionist uh, in your back pocket uh, answering questions for you uh, is, is absolutely a good idea. Yeah, maybe that's a nutritionist, maybe that's an extension specialist, um, uh, somebody of the sorts who's, who's qualified to answer those kinds of questions. Um, yeah, the more support that you can have uh, when it comes to management decisions for your herd, uh, the better. Okay, on our cow-calf operation, we do rotational grazing. Does that affect the time of when bulls want to breed or interrupted? Hmm, I, I guess I, I think if you're coming from a, a bull libido standpoint, that's how I'm reading that and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the way that I'm reading that is the, the ambition or the, the desire for bulls to breed if you're on a rotational grazing system as compared to maybe a season long uh, grazing system. Uh, I don't I don't know that that the type of grazing season would really affect the bull's ability or want to breed. Um, I would answer that like uh, answer that question like that. If anybody else has something else maybe to contribute um, to that question, I would welcome it. But if I'm if I'm answering that question correctly, I would say um, that rotational grazing maybe isn't going to affect that bull's ability to breed. I see Travis addressed that question. Thanks, Travis. I never heard that one. So that was a, that was a new one for me, but that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, we will give you guys like one more minute to get your questions in <laughs> and then <laughs> We will let Jennifer out of the hot seats. You guys, it was so fun hearing your guys' <laughs> questions. And yeah, hearing all of the other stuff, like I had never heard that your bull is worth five calves. Well, yeah. I also want to know, like, is it five calves sold this year when there's money in cattle or right. five years when it costs more to feed them than it's worth? Yeah, that explanation Travis has on there, that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so thank you for that. I don't, I don't know, maybe I've, I've been in the shadows or I've been in the dark, why well, I've never heard that one, um, but definitely makes sense. Does it affect breeding when you give your bull antibiotics? Oh, that is a good question. So maybe I'll back into that a little bit more. Depending on the reason you gave your bull antibiotics, um, there, there might be some uh, some infections in the reproductive tract that might be a reason to give antibiotics. Uh, in that case, uh, I would definitely wait a little bit before turning that bull out to breed. Um, there's some things, some bulls can have some infections uh, or some essentially some, uh, some presence of white blood cells uh, in the semen. And that means that there is an infection present somewhere. Uh, when a bull is breeding uh, and they've got white blood cells in their semen, uh, we can have some issues uh, with fertility. I guess in terms of like, if we're talking like withdrawal on the antibiotic or antibiotics in the system, I'm not sure I have a good answer to that, uh, but there may be some, some preemptive reasons why you might've given your bull antibiotics. That might be a better reason uh, to hold him off breeding for a little bit uh, or some reasons that might affect his breeding success. Sorry, I don't have a better answer for you on that one, Bella. Use range cubes for your cows. Uh, yeah, at home we do. Um, and there's a lot of different cubes that you can get. Um, depending on what you're looking for, if you're looking for a protein supplement, if you're looking for an energy supplement, uh, maybe a convenient way to deliver mineral uh, or remnants into cows, for example, uh, range cubes can be really effective. Um, but yeah, if, if that's something that you're interested in, uh, talk, to, talk to a nutritionist, talk to a feed company. Um, you can get a, a, a range cake a spreader that you can put on the back of a four-wheeler uh, and you can take cubes out to pasture to your cows and dump them. Uh, you can give them to, to lots of classes of cattle. Um, but yeah, good question. Uh, if you're interested in that, yeah, I would definitely talk to uh, a nutritionist uh, or your, uh, your fo local folks at the feed store. 
Do injectable dewormers given to the bulls at semen testing affect their fertility? As far as I know, they don't. Um, a lot of bulls actually uh, receive an injectable dewormer at the time of breeding soundness exams. Um, there, maybe somebody can, can answer this better than I can, but as far as I know, uh, dewormers aren't affecting their immediate fertility, but might have to look into that one again for you, Kaylee, um, and, and double check on that. But yeah, that's my, that's my answer right now for that one. Would you use them on your bulls? I think that's referring to the range cubes. Um, if your bulls need it, um, uh, I guess something to keep in mind when it comes to bull nutrition, and you might talk about this uh, in the next couple of webinars, um, is that bulls work pretty hard for a couple months out of the year, um, and then they're kind of just lounging. Uh, if they're only out for one breeding season, um, it's important that sure you get bulls back into condition after the end of the breeding season. Um, but if bulls don't necessarily need that extra uh, protein or that extra energy, uh, it might just contribute to them getting too fat uh, and too big. Um, but if it's if it's something that that works uh, in their ration or in their in their daily feed, um, based on based on their weight and what what weight you're trying to get them to, yeah, it can be an option for them for sure. Is a limp in your bull a big deal or is it an easy fix? Uh, a way to answer that, maybe what foot. Um, if we think about what feet a bull really needs uh, or, or what feet are important for a bull uh, or most important for the bull uh, are his back too. Uh, obviously, because if a bull needs to uh, mount a cow, he stands on his back two feet. Um, so a limp on a front foot, probably less of a big deal, uh, but a limp on a back foot could keep that bull from mounting cows and doing his job. Um, so yeah, that could absolutely be an issue. Um, kind of depends on on what's going on. Um, foot rot is, is really common uh, in bulls on pasture. It happens a lot. Um, and so for them, I mean, uh, Maybe a, an assumption is that if a bull starts limping, maybe it's foot rot. Uh, maybe he stepped wrong when he when he was mounting a cow. Maybe he stepped in a rut, uh, something like that. Uh, most of them would be a pretty simple uh, fix. Uh, might be something a little bit more serious. You'd hope a bull doesn't break a leg out on a pasture, but it happens too. Um, so yeah, I would consider what foot is it on? Um, and try and get that bull up close and maybe you can take a better look at it uh, or run him in the trailer and take him to the vet if at all possible so he can be back um, on all four quickly. And Travis confirmed that one for me. Thanks, Travis. Uh, dewormers uh, not affecting sperm quality uh, and, and overall uh, and overall health. So dewormers aren't affecting bull fertility. Uh, thank you, Travis. What are some ways to help with preventing foot rot or watching for signs? Um, and so foot rot uh, comes on for a lot of different reasons. Um, and sometimes we see foot rot a lot uh, when bulls are, um, well, there's lots of things that can happen. Sometimes bulls or some animals will stand in water uh, for a long time and sometimes some infection will start to grow uh, up in between their hooves. Uh, sometimes there might be a crack to a hoof and cause some infection in there. Um, there is a foot rot vaccine. Its efficacy, uh, maybe not totally sure that it's it's 100% reliable. Um, I guess if you, if you see foot rot coming on, you're probably gonna see some swelling in the foot. Uh, you'll maybe see him kind of holding that foot up uh, starting to get a little lame on the foot, um, the, the hoof definitely starts to swell up and you might see some signs uh, of an abscess in there. Um, for the most part though, if you, if you catch it early um, and you can get him into the vet, uh, maybe get some, some antibiotics in him uh, and maybe get a wrap on the foot, you can uh, maybe get ahead of it and, and clean him up. Uh, if it's all summer before you notice a, a foot rot case though, um, it might be a pretty nasty one to try to uh, fix if it's if it's a really, really bad infection. Um, again, yeah, the foot rot vaccine isn't uh, isn't one hundred percent reliable, so prevention uh, might be kind of tough. If you dart a bull to treat foot rot, will it make the bull infertile? Uh, not necessarily. 
uh, depending on, uh, I guess, I don't know if some, um, I maybe have to look at some some different antibiotics and, and what their response is going to be uh, or what their implications would be for bull fertility. Um, but from my from my best knowledge, uh, darting a bull um, to treat him for some foot rot isn't going to uh, destroy his uh, semen quality. How often could you should you check your pastures when the cows or bulls are out breeding? Um, great question. Um, hmm, how often should you check your pastures? Uh, I would say at a minimum once a week. Um, there's some folks, you know, depending on how far away your pastures are, um, maybe that's not doable. Um, you know, pastures that are close to home, obviously you're going to see them more often. Uh, but if you can get up and check pastures uh, at least once a week, that's going to be uh, really good for um, if you can be there for a while too and kind of drive through the cows, check everybody out. Uh, maybe stay and watch a little bit. Uh, that's going to give you some indicators of, of um, is my bull able to, or are my bulls able to get around? Are they doing their job? Are they mounting cows? Um, are, are any cows, any bulls looking injured? Are they looking sick? Uh, that's a good time to, to treat or run animals into treat as well. So that would be uh, my answer to that one. Good one. Thanks, and Travis, like, for the confirm on that one. <laughs> and just like that, Jen, I think they're tired of questions. I think I am too. <laughs> They've been great though. Thank you all. Those are, those are awesome questions. That was a good discussion. So thank you guys so much for tuning in tonight. We'll be back next week with, I think it's show cattle nutrition, I think. But I'm really excited for that presentation. I hope you guys are checking along with that as well. Um, if there's, um, like we said, if it was mentioned in the comments earlier, if you guys want to get on and find these recordings, they'll be available on the NDSU Animal Science YouTube page. So with that, thank you for joining and have a great night. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>